witnesses here. I believe my staff is getting them out of the hallway. Um, but I'll begin, and I believe they will arrive. OK. Greetings, uh, Madam Chair members. I want to thank committee staff for their technical expertise and partnership in reworking AB 3211. And I know we have a chair who's deeply committed to these issues. So thank you for your work, Madam Chair. We gladly accept the committee amendments listed in today's analysis. As all of you have heard me say, I do tech legislation to protect our children, my growing girls. And at issue today is the basis of their reality and safety. Committee staff framed it well. Image manipulation and video doctoring have existed for nearly as long as photography and recording equipment, but they have historically required great effort and talent. Generative AI, or Gen AI, has changed that. Our ability to understand the fundamental, fundamentals of our society and ensure basic safety. Undressing apps are rampant. These applications allow a user to create non-consexual intimate images, also known as deep fake pornography. Creating convincing deep fakes takes less than 20 minutes and costs only a dollar. Women and girls in particular are vulnerable to this harm, and it has already been seen in California's high schools and middle schools. Technology is evolving rapidly. And according to investigative work of the New York Times, the models are updated so frequently that a chatbot that struggles with a task one day might mysteriously excel at it the next. Google has been public uh, that their Synth ID watermarking technology is in beta testing. Academics are making strides in, meta meta in metadata and stenography. And companies have made, made commitments to this administration uh, at the White House um, and international standards making bodies. But we as policymakers need to inform the pace of this development and the expectations for public disclosure. This bill is a broad framework to legally require companies to take on the responsibility of protecting our information environment, our children, and our democracy. The, the issue of generative AI produced content can be tackled through a three-step plan that was outlined in the committee analysis. First, all artificial content must be labeled as such. Second, all real content, such as video and audio, audio recordings, must be labeled as such. Third, the large online platforms must be required to prominently display these labels, allowing us users to distinguish between artificial and real content. As the committee analysis stated, the bill seeks to enact the plan described above. It would, one, require the providers of Gen AI systems to enable watermarking detailing content provenance into all Gen, Gen AI outputs. Secondly, digital cameras and other recording devices to offer users the option to embed watermarkings into outputs. And lastly, social media companies to prominently display the labels that contain the provenance information of real and Gen AI produced content. I believe I have folks testifying. Um, they should be coming. I do have two people testifying. Um, maybe we can move on to opposition. Sure. Uh, while yes, we're and we will give them, them their time. I know time. we went a little bit out of order, so. Yes, they might have not. Uh, so opposition bit, but wants to come Ken on Wang with Legal Counsel is cited will be here, um, who's the sponsor of the bill, and David Evan Harris, formerly of Meta and currently of the Chancellor's Public School, uh, sorry, Chancellor's Public Scholars at UC Berkeley will be here as well. But we can move on to. Um, yeah, so we can go to opposition. We will come back and give them their time when they're here. So opposition, please join us. We'll go a little out of order. Since so there's two, we'll do two minutes each for both support and opposition. When you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Kara Bunder, testifying on behalf of the Computer and Communications Industry Association in respectful opposition to AB 3211. CCIA is an international not-for-profit trade association with about two dozen members from a range of communications and technology firms. While we understand lawmakers' interests in mitigating potential harms associated with AI-generated synthetic content, as written, the bill raises several concerns. We are still working through reviewing the recent proposed committee amendments and look forward to providing additional feedback as needed. The bill's prescriptive requirements, particularly because of the current technical limitations for watermarking and digital provenance technologies, is problematic. Many of our members are working to implement tools to better detect and label AI-generated content, but the tools that are currently available are not always reliable or accurate. And while such technology is evolving, so are the means for bad actors to evade such detection. Further, the bill raises questions about how to effectively watermark AI-generated text or voice responses. For example, when asked a question and provided a written response, a large language model is unable to watermark AI-generated text. 
and commonly used voice assistants, such as on mobile phones and smart home devices, produce AI-generated voice responses, but we cannot watermark those voice responses either. In the ever-changing AI landscape, we suggest that the bill be targeted to high-risk cases. For instance, responsible digital services are proactively implementing safeguards to swiftly remove illegal or dangerous content, like AI-generated image images depicting CSAM. By persistently addressing these well-defined and agreed-upon risks, platforms foster an environment conducive to harm mitigation without impeding the innovation ecosystem. Limiting provenance and watermarking requirements to high-risk applications also helps guard against counterproductive unintended consequences. There are risks of notification fatigue or banner blindness. This has been prevalent with website operators' attempts to comply with the EU's website cookie disclosure requirements, which showed that overly broad disclosure obligations could be highly disruptive while providing limited consumer safety benefits. On behalf of CCIA, I appreciate your consideration of these comments, and thank you for the time. Thank you. We'll finish opposition yeah. and go to sport. Okay, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jason Schmelzer with Shaw Entry Schmelzer and Lang, and today I will be uh, doing my best Dylan Hoffman uh, impression on behalf of TechNet. <laughs> we, we are respectfully opposed uh, to AB 3211. While we agree that the intent uh, of AB 3211 to create greater trust uh, is a good one, uh, we're concerned about many aspects of the bill. Uh, we're still reviewing uh, the amendments, but believe there are still a number of issues that need to be resolved. But we look forward to working uh, with the author uh, and potentially providing uh, amendments that help us uh, out in this situation. Uh, however, as the bill is in print, uh, it presents multiple uh, problems um, that require platforms to comply with the technologically infeasible and impossible standards. First, while we understand that the desire to regulate uh, an emer first, while we understand the desire to regulate an emerging technology, this is an area that would benefit from federal standards and regulation rather than a state-by-state -state approach. Many of our companies and platforms are at the forefront of developing content provenance and watermarking technology, which is still in its early stages. As a general note, content provenance and watermarking uh, is incredibly unreliable and in many cases easy to break. Researchers at the University of Maryland were able to break uh, all of the currently available watermarking methods. Uh, some, can be, uh, some can be avoided by simple cropping, resizing, or screenshotting of an image. Uh, more concerning, the researchers were able, to, were able to insert fake watermarks and credentials into images, creating false positives. Any bill on this topic uh, should account for this unreliability, especially when considering the overly punitive fine structure within the bill. Uh, if laws uh, exceed the industry's technological capabilities, consumers might place too much trust uh, in a, and credence in watermarks, making them more susceptible to bad actors' uh, attempts to deceive. As it relates to this bill, 83rd, 80, AB 3211 enacts requirements for a technology that is still under development and is rapidly evolving. Uh, for example, there isn't a system that can break a uh, isn't a system that can break a watermark text, uh, making the bill's requirements to do so impossible to comply with. Uh, furthermore, uh, in its standards for large online platforms, AB 3211 should more clearly delineate between first and third party content. First party content would be images, videos, or audio that is generated uh, using a covered provider's generative AI uh, or tools and then is posted for distribu distribution. Dylan would want me to tell you you're over your time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, <laughs> thank you. For these reasons, we're respectfully opposed at this time, but look forward to working with the author in the coming days. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. We'll move on to support, and then I'll call both support and opposition to the mic. We're just going to do this all out of order. Go ahead. I can go first. Uh, good afternoon, Chair members, and apologies for, for our tardiness. Uh, my name is Ken Wang, and I'm representing the California Initiative for Technology and Democracy, or CITED for short. We're proud to sponsor AB 3211, which would require watermarking and provenance data for content generated by generative AI systems. CITED, which is the newest project of California Common Cause, came together to seek state-level solutions to the threats that disinformation, artificial intelligence, deepfakes, and other emerging technologies pose to our democracy and our elections. We approach these issues through a cross-disciplinary approach advised by leaders from civil rights and civic engagement, law and public policy, industry and tech, and more. To that end, CITED is proud to sponsor AB 3211, which would add an important tool to our arsenal to help stem the tide of AI-generated disinformation. The committee analysis details several disturbing examples for how generative AI is currently being used to create non-consensual non intimate imagery, perpetuate financial scams, and swing close elections. 
Given the scale of the challenge before us, various efforts have already been initiated to address the issue. For, exa for example, the EU's new AI Act is leading the way by requiring companies to develop content authentication and provenance mechanisms to tackle AI-generated disinformation. But domestic work efforts have been far weaker. Federal action has been limited to the Biden administration's executive order on AI, which tasked the Commerce Department to develop guidance for content authentication, and various tech firms have also committed to voluntary efforts to establish industry standards. Cited believes that California has the opportunity as the home of Silicon Valley and the heartland of AI innovation to lead the US's response to these threats. AB 3211 represents the important first step for our state to shape the solution. So lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Assembly Member Wicks for your leadership on this important issue and for the chair and the committee staff for your hard work on the amendments. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Cited's technical advisor. Chair and members of the committee, it's an honor to be able to speak with you today and to convey my strong support of AB 3211, the California Provenance Authenticity and Watermarking Standards. My name is David Harris, and I'm here in my capacity as a senior policy advisor to CITED. I am also a Chancellor's Public Scholar at UC Berkeley, a senior advisor for AI and elections to the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU. I have advised the White House, the European Union, and the United States Congress about AI policy, and I also currently sit on a task force at NATO on AI and disinformation. AI is a powerful tool that can bring benefits to so many people, but it also, if not governed judiciously, has the power to cause great harm. I previously worked at Facebook and Meta as a research manager on the civic integrity and responsible AI teams, where I carefully studied so many of the harms that AI can bring. You've already heard about the harms of AI-generated non-consensual intimate imagery and child sexual abuse material that can be produced by AI. Misinformation campaigns can also be supercharged by AI. We're familiar with these campaigns from the 2016 efforts by Russia to interfere in our elections through social media. The Department of Homeland Security has already warned us that China, Russia, and Iran are likely to use generative AI to target our elections. Watermarking is the best available tool we have to allow us to identify what content is produced by AI and what content is, synth is authentic. AB 3211 requires that AI companies make good on the promises that they have already made to add watermarking to their AI systems. These promises, promises made by many of the members of TechNet and NetChoice, were made first at the White House in the White House Voluntary AI Commitments from last July, and were made again in public at the Munich Security Conference's AI Elections Accord, again signed by many of the members of TechNet and NetChoice, where a commitment was made this February to implement watermarking features in AI systems. Given that it's already been nine months since the White House AI voluntary commitments were made, and we've seen little progress, I believe that we have no other option than to legally require companies to take on this responsibility and protect our information environment, our children, and our democracy. Thank you so much. Now, anyone here in support that wants to come up to the mic and weigh in? Support first. Trent Lang, California Clean Money Campaign and strong support. And for support and opposition, just name, organization, and position, please. Thank you. Daniel Pearl on behalf of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees and strong support. to do it is always a question. Tracy Rosenberg, yeah. Open Privacy, we are support if <laughs> amended, and we are checking out the committee's amendments. Thank you. But you generally love our amendments. Yeah. <laughs> Shane Gusman on behalf of SAG after in support. Thank you. OK, now, anyone in opposition, please join us. Name, organization, and position. Yeah, Cameron Dimitri with Capital Advocacy on behalf of NetChoice. We like to align our comments with CCIA and TechNet. Thank you. Hi, Ronak Dewami with Cal Chamber. Also align our comments with the opposition. Thank you. Thank you. OK, seeing no additional witnesses here in the room, I'll bring it back to the committee. But before I do, I want to take a moment of personal privilege and just commend committee staff on the excellent work on all of the bills up today. The analyses, the amendments, all of it, I think, was really phenomenal. So with that, Mr. Wynn. 
Uh, thank you very much. And, and um, Assemblymember Wicks, I, I know you have done, you've taken on all the big tasks in protecting our uh, children on the internet, and it's, it is uh, really critical, especially the previous uh, presentation was on uh, mental health, and we know how, how they are linked. And, you know, I do think that, that um, when you talk about deep fakes or um, AI-generated images, there's a threat to democracy and a threat to our elections, and, and um, just that Americans don't, I mean, a threat to our children, too. But what, what we're hearing, I mean, I absolutely agree that everything should have a watermark, but what we hear from the opposition is that um, it's very easy to fake watermarks, and it's, um, you know, that the technology is not quite there yet. And so I agree with everything you're saying, but how do we get um, Americans to trust watermarks if it's so easy to overcome a watermark? I would actually, if the chair is okay, I yes, actually like my witnesses to answer because of their technical expertise. Yeah, please. David. Thank you so much. That's an excellent question. And that's one of the reasons why the approach of AB 3211 requires watermarks to be inserted not only in synthetic content created by generative AI systems, but also in content that is authentic, that is created by the camera in the iPad sitting right in front of you, or by your phone, uh, or by any recording device. It's very important that we attack the problem of, <clears throat> of AI-generated content that could be used in, in abusive ways from both sides, both ensuring that we can identify clearly and easily what is real and what is fake. There is no currently perfect solution for AI watermarking that makes it absolutely impossible to circumvent. But this is a case where we should not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and we should be very careful if, uh, in listening to people who say, oh, it's not good enough, so we should do nothing. In the same sense, if, uh, if we ever found a, a seatbelt that could prevent every death in every automobile accident, accident that, that would be amazing, but that doesn't exist. Does that mean we should eliminate laws requiring seat belts in cars? I don't think so. Just because a, a solution is not a silver bullet to every single problem associated with AI does not mean that we should throw up our hands and give up entirely. Oh, no, I don't think we should give, give up entirely. That's certainly not what I'm saying, and I know that this bill will continue to move along, but the question is if initially you have, um, I don't know, 50% uh, trust that Americans can have, or Californians, 50% trust that, that something is authentic, um, that is problematic for later on. They might never believe anything that they see if, if that's kind of their first introduction to watermarks. Yeah, it's, that's absolutely a, a valid concern. <clears throat> the good news is that there are a number of companies that have already developed viable solutions that are marketing and talking about them publicly. One of those solutions is from Google, and it's called SynthID. Google is a member of an association, the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, that has many of the major companies also that are members of the, the groups represented here today. Um, and, and Google has committed to leading that initiative towards deploying watermarks. The problem is um, they and many of these other companies have been now committing to do this for nine plus months. And we have to ask, how long do we wait? And there's also a problem with waiting to require it, that that actually benefits the companies that are not taking initiative, and it punishes the companies like Google, like Adobe, like Microsoft, that are moving forward through this coalition for co content provenance and authenticity, taking initiative, putting out possible solutions, but they're getting punished because the, when the others don't go along, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. And that's why the CEOs of these companies are calling for regulation. They are begging for regulation. So, the, so if you say Google is at the forefront, how, um, how much can we trust their watermarks? Yeah, the, the unfortunate thing is that we don't have a law in place yet that requires a company that deploys watermarks to allow researchers to study them and scrutinize them. That is one of the, uh, one of the 
one of the items in AB 3211 is that it requires companies that do uh, implement watermarks to submit them to red teaming, which is an adversarial method of testing, where people from outside try to break their watermarks and see if they can break them, and then they improve the technology. That's why we've really designed uh, this bill to be something that makes these technologies improve over time and gives them space to flourish. Yeah, and, and I 100% agree that we need to be able to authentic, uh, authenticate uh, content. I'm just, I'm just concerned right now that the technology is, is not there. And, and so, um, but, but obviously we need companies to take responsibility and develop as, as quickly as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I get that. The, the, I guess the one thing, oh, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, no, I, I appreciate that. I mean, we're, we're trying to think uh, in a certain way, create a regulatory framework and get ahead of some of the concerns that we have, right? That we're already seeing. I mean, you're reading about it right now in the paper of, as mentioned in, in middle schools and high schools, the non-consensual pornographic imagery that's being created very readily and quickly and easily. Um, so the, some of this stuff is happening obviously in real time. We also have a long legislative process, right? Um, and there's time. And I genuinely think, from my perspective, having the input of the companies at, is absolutely critical, which is why I shared language with many of them before the bill was even introduced. I want them to be thought partners. I want to work with opposition to make sure we can do this in a way that's implementable. And if that means looking at implementation dates or other things that give us sort of runway to help kind of think this stuff through, I'm very open to putting all those things on the table. And the last thing I'll say, Ms. Irwin, is you're one of the like thought leaders in the tech space. I'd welcome you in that, given your expertise, um, if you want to um, help me with that and work on that together. No, I appreciate that. And, and I know you always work with all stakeholders, so um, this is definitely not criticism of that. It's just kind of this weighing of, yeah. of how do we get there. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Thank you. Um, thank you for uh, introducing this bill. I know it's something we've had conversations uh, prior to this year as well, uh, how deeply you've been studying how to get ahead of the negative consequences of um, what, what could happen. And I think we share all of those goals as well, too. And I guess uh, aligning with, but maybe also um, trying to simplify, from, from my mind, um, some of my colleagues' comments as well. So the... the, the um, the, the watermark technology, and while it's not wholly worked out yet, but yet we're trying to define it and regulate it right now, like can you, what, what in your words is, is a watermark? Sure, I mean, in, from my perspective, it's um, a system that can embed invisible information to ensure you can identify um, what, what you're actually looking at. And there's you know, multiple methods of watermaking and digital media, both the synthetic and the authentic, and it's not a new technology. Right. Um, you know, many watermarking techniques um, used today are similar to those originally developed for the digital rights uh, management. The system implement, implemented 10 to 20 years ago to stop um, online piracy of music and other things of that nature. Okay. Um, it's just more, it obviously needs to be more advanced now, but it's essentially, the way I think about it in its most simplest terms is creating um, like breadcrumb trails throughout the process. Okay. So, so we know when we can see if when know who's images who. have been manipulated. So you know who's who, the origin of it, and you're able to sort of, try, okay. Um, and no, if we could ask, there's audio that's looping back here, so we're getting kind of an echo. There is the TV. The audio TV there. outside is very loud. I, I know. I feel like I'm in on. concert. You know? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's funny, I think you're actually louder in the hallway than in the room. Yeah, I know. No one wants me in concert. Yeah. And so we're still improving upon what this is and, and how to define it, and therefore how we should responsibly address or regulate. Um, but what? Talk to me about the um, European Union story, right? Because we're saying that this isn't already um, uh, happening yet, I guess, back to opposition's points, um, that we're putting the cart before the horse, I guess. But we seem to be looking towards some success stories, some that, that, that are modeled on, well, that are that are found on, I think, a lot of deep thought that, that a lot of those policymakers have been able to put into it. And I uh, will be the first to say on this dais that, you know, the reason why California is leading on this is because we don't have confidence that we're going to get federal legislation through, and we need to be able to set that bar. That is why I think it's so important that she's that we're working on this. Um, but talk about the EU's maybe sure. evolution and, of this. Sure. And Mr. Harris actually advised the EU process, and so I think has a pretty intimate experience of how those regulations were put together, and I would, with the chair's permission, defer to him. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, these are wonderful questions, and I 
want to give some context. I've visited Brussels twice in the last eight months to speak with the people involved in the, in the drafting and implementation of the EU's AI Act. That act is in the very, very final stages of being approved. The act does require watermarking of AI-generated content. The way the European Union works is that there is an implementation phase that will take place during the one year following the final approval by the European Union's Council of Ministers, which is expected to happen in the coming weeks. During that one year period, there will be a process that is referred to as co-regulation, where groups of companies will actually uh, be convened alongside a, sta a European standards body called CENSENELEC, that will eventually own a standard that is used to um, create the presumption of compliance with the EU AI Act. And we've actually been, as the sponsor of this bill, um, cited has been in, in communication with, uh, with that team um, and, and had conversations to really understand the direction they're going. Uh, what would happen if this bill um, passes is that we would have two parallel processes of implementation that would be roughly alongside each other between California and the European Union, um, where uh, up until the moment when they are required for full implementation, and I think there would be great opportunities to, uh, you know, to collaborate and learn from uh, what they've already learned by passing the requirement ahead of us. But in some ways, uh, California would have the ability to jump ahead by passing this bill, um, depending on the final timeline. Passing, jumping ahead, but also sort of meeting European counterparts as well, which I would also argue for content that's created, for information that is shared on a World Wide Web that, you know, we could probably be on, in parity to protect our our users here in, in, in this state. Yeah, and with the chair's permission, you, you got the gavel, Joe. <laughs> Great, Mr. Yeah. Patterson's got the gavel. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is that we do have conformity. I think, you know, when we have various states considering different things, federal government, European Union, there's a lot out there. And as much conformity as we can give around definitions and standards, I think it's better for the consumer. I think it's better for the companies. I think it's better for implementation. And so that is really important to me as we work through this process and making sure that we're working and mindful of all the other regulatory entities that are out there to try and it's to like, conformity. On one hand, like I'm I'm, I'm sympathetic to um, the concerns that we don't have that definition yet or we're still working on things, so it's very difficult to get ahead of that and predict that, but it's also happening over here in this space. And if we're just trying to conform to that, is this something that hopefully as the year moves forward that, that, that definitions and, and, and application can, can be worked out? What, what, do you have concerns with, with where this is going globally? I'm happy to chime in a little bit on this, and I have to say, as uh, the fact that I work in the state capacity, I do have counterparts at CCIA who are based in Brussels and have been working with the European Commission there. Um, so I'd be happy to follow up with more of the specific concerns that they have with regard to what's going on across the pond, so to say. Um, but I do know that in speaking with some of my other counterparts that, you know, there is some sentiment that because to, to the other witnesses' point that this is not something that's already being implemented. It's kind of too soon to say what the other broader impacts of this are going to be yet. So by potentially going down that same route, it's, there's still a lot of unknowns, especially given the technical feasibility limitations. Fair, thank you. The, the last sort of observation that you know, I want to thread into all of this is that you know, are, we, are we trying to you know, create a law that is um, going after, you know, the image itself, uh, the, the actual content, or are we going over the, uh, trying to do something to be, prevent a negative action, right? Is it the thing or is it the action? And for me, it's about more so we want to be able to make sure that there's no, um, there, 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 there's, no there, there's no actions that are out there that are, are, are harming um, or, or going against uh, any of our societal values mm -hmm. um, or as uh, to the, the the monikers out there, deep faking, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so that's something I'm gonna be looking forward as this bill does kind of move forward because maybe, you know, 99% of the content that's out there uh, for entertainment or for other purposes is completely fine and, right. and, and is obvious, right? right. But it's, uh, and, 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 and that action also could take the form of somebody that's getting around the technology of watermarking or having a fake watermark attached to it. And so what do we, what do, we do about that when they meet the, meet the test of, of your bill mm -hmm. uh, by applying a watermark but are still creating the harm? Right. So there's just a lot, a lot to think through on this, which mm -hmm. is super interesting, and I, and I want to see it continue. Um, but 
thank you for yeah. helping to tease out some of these issues. Yeah, it, um, I appreciate that. It's uh, you know, it's a newer technology. You know, I think the manipulation that exists within these types of in imaging really corrode our trust in the system. I think trust is really important. I actually see a lot of exciting value in AI, um, and I'm genuinely excited that it's here, and I think it's gonna mean a lot of economic growth and um, solving problems we haven't even figured out yet. Um, but we have to have trust with that process too, and I think that's why we're trying to figure out a sort of surgical regulation here on a very specific piece of AI that's narrowly tailored, because when you do have that manipulated content, I mean, ask the young girls who've had these you know, non-consensual imagery shared amongst all their classmates, right? Or, you know, elected officials who have deep fakes saying things that they, they don't believe in. I think you're right, 99% of the content out there is probably fine, right? But there's that 1% that that's what we're trying to really guard against here. Um, and again, I, I genuinely welcome um, opposition on this because I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a, a tech, I'm a politician, right? I need the technical expertise from the companies, from the in-house folks at the companies to help us think through how do you actually create a bill that can be implemented in an effective way. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, and then we'll go to Mr. Kirk. Great, thank you. Um, just a comment uh, in terms of the, the type of deep fakes out there uh, or you know content that could be created. I'm, you know, much more concerned right now about it being used for um, sexual content of, of minors or just, you know, sextortion or, or something like that. Uh, obviously, democracy is very important, but oftentimes people can kind of figure that out uh, at some point. But I wanted to make a, a comment and then ask a question to the author, but the comments more to the witness. Um, you mentioned that, you know, if it's... Uh, you know, just because it's not a perfect solution, you know, doesn't mean we shouldn't move forward. But I think the concern here is that, um, is that the the false sense of security. You know, if if I buy a car, and I, uh, you know, it comes with seatbelts, and they tell me the seatbelts are gonna, you know, uh, close when there's an accident, whether or not uh, that actually saves my life or not. You know, there's a level of assurances and a lot of regulation around knowing that that is going to happen. And I'm not, I don't know if I have entire level of confidence that if there's an image out there that, that other technology, you know, foreign actors or something like that aren't going to be able to create some kind of watermark that makes it also seem like it's a, uh, you know, safe product. And so I don't know if you want to respond to that, but... Uh, I'm very concerned about the false sense of security. Uh, may I have permission? Please. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I think that's a very appropriate question to be asking. And I think that as this uh, bill were it to, to pass and become law is implemented, you'll see different phases. And one, one of the phases is the phase in, uh, before people have updated their, their phones. Now, software updates on phones are actually a, a very interesting part of this, right? I, I assume you sometimes download and install updates on your phone. Right? It's automatic. It's automatic, yeah. perfect. Right, that's because computer security is not a solvable problem. This is, uh, this is something that's discussed a lot in the security community. It's not something that you just finish, you never do. And that's why we have to keep installing these updates and keep improving the software. And that's why the language of this bill is intended in many ways to be uh, what, what we'd refer to as self-updating. We use terms like state of the art to require that the companies use the best available standards and we also um, have, have built this, excuse me, this bill um, to facilitate and, and require the type of adversarial testing that mimics the state actors that you're discussing, that looks for, get the smartest people in the room together, try to break the watermarks and try to make them as robust and indelible and difficult to remove as possible. And the, the problem is that we are not getting over the hump to doing anything, to implementing this without 
the shove. We, we need the shove to get the companies to do this now. They promised last summer to do it. They promised this spring, and it, it, it needs to happen. And without getting them over the hump, we don't have that opportunity. I spoke today with a company that's in the watermarking business that said, you know, if, if the companies were ready, they could deploy this in a matter of months. It could be deployed as a software update to your phone. So it's, it's not impossible. It should be out there. It should be robustly tested. People should be attempting to break it. And, uh, and once we get into that phase where, by default, all real pictures you take, all real videos you take, all audio recordings you take also have that signature of authenticity, then we get to a much better place where we have marking of authentic and synthetic content and the lack of a watermark that proves uh, the provenance of a piece of content itself becomes a symbol that that is not trustworthy. So a, a bad actor taking away a watermark is not as much of a threat. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys have a thought on that or? Just just briefly, I, you know, this is, it's been mentioned a few times when we need to shove or it's sort of been asserted that the perfect is the enemy of the good or that we'd rather do nothing. And I just want to correct that notion. The witness himself has observed several things. One. <laughs> that, that several tech CEOs have made commitments around this area, that these same tech CEOs have created an association to develop this technology and deploy it. I do want to point out none of that technology has been deployed from my understanding, um, but we're also coming into committee today saying that we're working on amendments. So I do want to just correct the notion that a shove is needed to get us there or some other thing. But we're, the penalty here is 5% of global revenues. So the discomfort is rational. That we've sort of established that it's a, a nascent technology, that it's imperfect. No. And while there is a very complex scheme here that's been developed, again, non-compliance for our members is 5% uh, of, of global revenue. So that leaves us obviously very uncomfortable. The last thing is NCII and CCM have been brought up. I, I would just point out that there are other bills that are very specific to those issues that are in the legislature right now uh, that TechNet, uh, for one, is supporting. So, um, well, thanks. You kind of actually kind of went into what I was next going to get to. Sometimes, is uh, being in the um, uh, minority party, um, you know, you kind of read the tea leaves that bills are going to get out of committee, um, and so uh, you know, you want to see if there are ways that you can maybe work with the author to to get it out. Despite the fact that bet you gets out, <laughs> um, I always welcome working. Yes, with the I, I really appreciate that about you. Uh, is that you do always check in with me to see where I'm at on bills, and um, you know that it means a lot because you don't necessarily need my vote, you know. And uh, but so I wanted to ask. I am very concerned about the penalty, uh, and if that's something you might be willing to work on, I could I could get to support position today. Yeah, I'm willing to work on that with you. Okay, and great. and I also want to acknowledge the comments here. I mean, I do think I've been impressed with the um, uh, the the not response because that's the wrong word. The proactive nature of the tech CEOs in this space, um, and I and a lot of what we're looking at is modeled off of their commitments. So um, I I, and I genuinely welcome them again in this in this conversation and welcome the companies in the conversation for sure because we can't do it without them right um, so I appreciate your comments and would love to work with you Mr Patterson okay I remember I, I used to be a staffer a while ago and the penalties and bills used to be like ten thousand dollars per violation now I'm seeing a million dollars <laughs> so you know it's, inflation's we do have inflation but uh, it's the cost of living you know, Mr Patterson yeah exactly so um, I love to work to bring with down you the housing on that so. uh, I'll, prices as well. With that commitment, I'll, I'll support this bill Thank today, you. and uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, this has been a, an excellent conversation because we're dealing with something that we don't know how it's going to be fully formed. I, a couple questions. Um, have you, you, you talk to the tech people all the mm -hmm. time, the tech executives and the, the key people. Have you uh, had a sense you could come to a, a statement of principles as we go forward with provenance and watermarking? Are, is everyone aligned on this and are approaching it similarly or in different ways? I mean, certainly they're mindful of what's going on in the EU. So are we coming to a standard, a uniform An standard? An industry standard, so to speak? Yeah. Ed, do you want to speak to that? Yeah. Um, 
Thank you, Ms. Dixon, for the question. So most of the major companies in the space have joined something called the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. Uh, Adobe is the one of the leaders of that, but uh, it's so, so many companies, Microsoft, Intel, Google joined more recently. Meta is not a member, but does support the standard that they are putting out. Um, and also the camera manufacturers, notably Sony, Nikon, Leica, Canon, have also joined this association. The association currently has only deployed something that does not meet the standard defined in this bill um, because it's a marking, a digital marking that is so easy to remove that you can take it off within seconds simply by taking a screenshot mm. of that marking. But what my understanding from speaking to um, people who work at the companies that are members of this coalition is that the coalition has active working groups that are also developing standards that meet, would meet the definitions of this bill. And um, just to, to move back to uh, correct something from one of our other witnesses, um, Google has deployed a product called Synth ID that comes from Google DeepMind, their AI branch in the UK. And Synth ID, they clearly state on their website, is a tool for watermarking of AI-generated images and audio that even if you manipulate the image or the audio, you take a picture of the picture, you re-record the audio, that watermark persists, is robust, and is uh, to the greatest extent possible indelible. And the good news is that actually at the Munich Security Conference in February, when the AI Elections Accord was signed by 20 of these major companies, um, most of whom I've, I've, I've mentioned already, uh, they specifically called out C2PA and SynthID as examples of the types of watermarks and the direction that they're going with the technology. So th the associations are there. The problem is there's a, there's a first mover disadvantage here. Google's invested clearly a lot in this. Adobe has as well. But then there are companies that are stragglers, notably uh, ByteDance, um, is, has, at least last I checked, was um, not a member, the owner of, of TikTok. Um, we don't see uh, Samsung participating in a meaningful way, and also we don't see Apple, um, which is surprising. So, I, But I do believe that if a bill like this were enacted, there would be in all likelihood a coalescing around the C2PA group and the standards that they have put forth and are developing, and they would advance much more quickly. Okay, well, I hope you're correct. I mean, as I'm listening to you explain that, all these different companies, just, I'm old enough to remember when it was DOS versus Apple versus IBM. And it was confusing for, uh, I mean, just from a capital investment standpoint and how do you, tr whom do you trust and which is the better technology? It would seem to me this is so fundamentally important. I have a question also similarly with my colleague about the violation fine. I think that's to be determined, but um, it would be magnificent. I mean, I know Assemblywoman, you like, to California to lead the way. Okay, California will lead the way in whatever solution we craft here in this legislative process. It would be really uh, not just fantastic, but it will be really important to 90% of the world's population who uses, uh, uses technology that we all can have confidence that all the players are aligned with a, with a common <coughs> platform technology dealing with provenance or watermark, uh, Apple may come out and call it something different, and it just would be not more, it'd be more than helpful, it's almost essential that the world align the technology companies, the leaders in the technology, not Adobe here and not somebody over here, because this is so fundamental. And I, I applaud you for doing this and creating this standard. I just wonder also, could we get those companies, every single TechNet member, whomever, to agree to a statement of principles of what we're trying to align forward? So when this comes to the floor of the legislature, both houses, you can say you have brought the industry together on something so fundamentally important that will protect our children and all users so we can have confidence in the system. Uh, I think it's a great idea. I'm definitely happy to try, Ms. Dixon. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I um, shared the language with um, a couple of the major companies before it was public. I really wanted their input and their take and have done, have had numerous conversations both with the trade associations and with the companies themselves. Um, and, you know, I don't want to reveal any of those conversations because some of those are not 
not public, but um, have gotten some good feedback from the companies too, you know? And I think they are genuinely trying. I, I do actually believe that. Um, it, but it's also ensuring that we have conformity across the, the system for them, I think is also really important. Well, I agree. And uh, I commend you for doing this. And it's a lot of, it's hurting rabbits here, but yeah. it's really essential. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members wanting to ask questions or provide feedback, I want to um, thank the author for her work on this. I think um, this was a very popular topic in the legislature. It continues to be, and I think it's a really important one. At the same time, what's been said here is true, right? This is a very young technology. Um, you know, the, one of the amendments here today um, sort of changed away from what Ms. Dixon was saying to allow for changes in technology in the future too, which I think is one of the important things is we make policy is none of this is gonna be static. And so how do we create policy that allows for innovation and change that will hopefully make it more trustworthy and stronger protections for consumers. But I think, you know, the author has mentioned many times today the um, non-consensual pornographic photographs. We've talked about the effects on our democracy in the recent elections throughout the country. We saw this kind of material propagating. And it is so critically important to the safety and security of this country and frankly this world that people know what is fact and what is fiction. And I think that is what you are trying to achieve here today. And so I wanna thank the opposition for being a partner in moving us to that state of affairs. And I think that one of the things I really like about this bill, because I think it hits on a lot of what was said here today, is that it both requires the watermarking technology, but it puts some of the onus on the distribution channels, which is so, so critical, because okay. that is where each of us will access this information. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that they are a partner in ensuring that what we access is, um, we're aware of what's real and what's not. And so I wanna commend you, I wanna thank committee staff for their extensive work on this bill. I know they did a lot to get it to where it is today and I know it will continue to change. Um, and so with that. I respectfully I ask for an I vote. Okay. Do we have a, did we have a motion? No, we need a motion. Do we have a motion on the bill? I'll so move. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Let's call the roll. Item number nine, eighty. Thirty-two eleven by Assemblymember Wicks. The motion is due pass as amended to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, Barrow Cahan. Aye. Barrow Cahan. Aye. Patterson. Aye. Patterson. Aye. Brian. Aye. Brian. Aye. Dixon. Aye. Dixon. Aye. Hoover. Not voting. Hoover not voting. Irwin. Lowenthal. Ortega. Ward. Wicks. Aye. Wicks. Aye. Wilson. The bill is 5-0, so it will go on hold while Thank we grab you. some members. Go on Thank call. You.